Today's news again starting in the south along the Israel-Gaza border. The Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry reporting at least six Palestinians injured during the ongoing riots. The Hamas terror group again organizing busloads of people, mostly youths and even children, to the security fence with Israel, where rioters threw explosives, burnt tires, and otherwise attempted to breach the barrier and harm Israeli forces. Israeli soldiers, for their part, responding with crowd control measures and live fire. Meantime, however, Israelis appearing to be turning on Israeli defense authorities and officials. This has thousands of Israelis arriving Monday night to the Kiryat Shaul Military Cemetery in Tel Aviv. Mourners laying 21-year-old border officer Barel Hadaria Shmueli to rest after he died in hospital earlier that day. Shmueli was shot in the head at point-blank range last week while stationed along the Gaza border. And Shmueli's family is now calling for an official commission of inquiry into his death, levying serious blame for his murder against the IDF and Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. Shmueli's mother, Nitsa, calling Bennett a waste for the state of Israel. <laughs> Specifically, the family is now asking how hundreds of Palestinians who were violently rioting were allowed not only to cross the perimeter line, but to get right up against the fence itself. Further, the family pointing to reports of vague IDF instructions that endangered the unit and poor contingency planning. For example, the family demanding to know why Shmueli was transferred to hospital via ambulance, which took nearly an hour from the time of his shooting, as opposed to in a helicopter. The military arguing, though, that apparently the ambulance was deemed a faster option. In other news, the recent landmark meeting between Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz and Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas already resulting in a massive windfall for the PA. Israel now agreeing to transfer some 500 million shekels or over $155 million to Ramallah as a loan intended to save its crisis-ridden economy. Additionally, the stabilizing loan is keeping Hamas at arm's length from the West Bank. The question is, how long will this Band-Aid hold? And what happens when it falls? Here with the analysis is former head of the IDF Central Command Strategic Planning Unit for Judea and Samaria, Colonel in the Reserves, Dr. Danny Tirza. Dr. Tirza, thanks so much for joining us. Now, Israel is loaning some 500 million shekels, but because of its sanctions and the PA terror stipends, Israel is also withholding nearly 600 million shekels. So first off, how much does this actually help, this, this difference of 100 million shekel? And what, is the, you know, what, are, what are the challenges that the PA is actually facing? Is this 100 shekels offset going to be enough, or 100,000, 100 million? The, the main problem is not the exact uh, amount of the money. The main problem is how the Palestinian Authority is going to use this money. Uh, usually what they're doing is uh, just using it for uh, their uh, uh, salaries of uh, 140,000 uh, Palestinian uh, uh, civil uh, employees. Uh, most of them are the policemen, but in all other. And uh, the main problem is not that uh, uh, using the money for the public. The main problem is that the Palestinian Authority is using this money for corruption on one hand, and the other hand is to give money to these uh, prisoners, what we are calling the terrorists in their eyes, they are the heroes um, of the revolution, and therefore they are the people that gain the money. So if the Palestinian Authority wants uh, to do some a cure to uh, her economic, she has to use the sources that uh, she has in uh, her hands. The problem is that they lie all the time on the money that uh, the country's donors to the Palestinian Authority and not doing anything for themselves. All the new industrial parks are, are just uh, 
uh, open. Nobody wants to work there. They want to work in Israel. They don't want to work in the Palestinian Authority. The people in the street blame Israel. They blame the Palestinian Authority. And the problem is that the people in the streets understand the situation that the Palestinian Authority don't want their own people to live in good standard of life, because if they will do so, no one will take part in uh, in the resistance against Israel. Okay. Again, though, if, so if we go back to the, that's to the, the issue, main dilemma but, of Israel. But, but again, again, Colonel, if we go back to this issue of pay for slay, Israel is withholding that money because the PA pays terrorists, who you said they call freedom fighters or martyrs, whatever it is. They never stopped those stipends. The PA just decided to divert funds, like you said, away from more important places towards corruption, towards these stipends. So. Isn't Israel really just caving in, in a sense, uh, on its sanctions? No. Israel is doing three things at the same time. One thing that we are trying to improve the standard of life of the people and try to help them, not through the Palestinian Authority, but we don't want to weaken the Palestinian Authority. And therefore, we have to do a lot of things through the Palestinian Authority, but to be sure that the money is not going to the wrong places. On the other hand, Israel all the time have to balance between the money that is given to Gaza and the uh, from other donors and the money that is given to the Palestinian Authority. If the Palestinian Authority will not have enough money for the salaries, the, nobody will take uh, care of uh, on them. The people in the streets understand that they need this money for the salaries. So let, let's talk now a little bit about the repayment plan. Israel plans to start repaying itself from PA taxes starting next June. But what's being done to address, again, these systemic issues that caused this crisis in the first place? Because if solutions are not implemented when Israel starts its withdrawals, the PA will be you know, just ahead of collapse again, won't it? No, Israel will see how we can take this, this money back. It's not that we're giving the money and we're going to take it next June. We'll take the money no, we'll take, I mean, time it, after time. We'll see sure. what's going on. Uh, uh, of course, we'll balance everything in the right time, the right conditions, and uh, we'll see what's going on. We have, uh, in our way, we have the guarantee that the money can come back to Israel. Uh, from the money that Israel collects the taxes for the Palestinian Authority. So it's not a matter of guarantee, it's a matter of time. And time we can give. All right. Colonel Teltza, thank you so much. Thank you. Moving on. Despite best efforts, the Israeli government just cannot seem to stop the proverbial bleeding. Coronavirus infections continuing to skyrocket hitting levels not seen since the beginning of the pandemic. Yet classrooms are set to reopen as planned. The coronavirus cabinet approving of the new school regulations overnight. Just as promised, the school year in Israel will begin on Wednesday, September 1. And authorities finally agreeing on how after a late night meeting Monday. First and foremost, rapid COVID testing will be made readily available across the country. Magen David Dome paramedics and IDF units already manning hundreds of such stations. Second, the Green Pass program will be applied to educational staff, meaning that if one doesn't want to wear a mask, they can't enter the classroom. Similarly, teachers who are not vaccinated will have to show negative COVID tests twice a week, get vaxxed, or stay at home. And this dictated directly from the courts, who ruled that staff must protect the younger students who cannot yet receive inoculations. Then the following remaining school regulations applying to grades 8 through 12 in red cities only or cities with high infection rates and or low vaccination rates. Classrooms where fewer than 70% of the students are vaccinated with at least their first dose will have to learn online. Then by the end of September, 70% of students will need two doses of the vaccine to forego mobile instruction. And finally, pupils learning online will be encouraged to vaccinate in school in order to move towards in-person learning. Despite the protestations of Education Minister Ifat Shasha Biton, who has been rallying hard against providing the vaccines during school hours. Now, while the government agreeing on the logistics of opening schools, however, not everyone is on board with opening, period. Just a day before the new school year even beginning, over 91,000 kindergartners and school-aged students are reportedly in isolation. 
and general infections are likewise reaching new heights, with the latest daily numbers of confirmed cases rising to nearly 11,000 and destroying the previous daily high of 10,118 recorded during the height of the third wave last January. That said, at the very least, the national infection rate seemingly stabilizing today, dropping to 7.5% from just under 8% on Monday. Experts giving credit to the slow but sure effects of the third vaccine booster campaign. Now, speaking of vaccines, after effectively volunteering to act as lab rat for the world, studies on Israel proving that the mRNA COVID vaccines work, and they work pretty well, which is a fact that's now also backed by the 2 billion other people who have been inoculated around the world, with over 5 billion doses. One big question is remaining, though. What about the long-term side effects? Well, medical experts in Israel have been telling the Jerusalem Post that there is no true reason to think that there ever will be any significant long-term effects. And so my question is, how do we know? Joining me to discuss is director of the International MA Program in Public Health from the University of Haifa, Professor Manfred Green. Professor, thanks so much for joining us today. Now, speaking Pleasure. with Jerusalem Post, several doctors and professors are alleging that, quote, there is no evidence of something happening unless it happened in the first two months, two hours, weeks, et cetera. Uh, they add that we do not have any other examples in which the immune system uh, decided to suddenly react to a vaccine that was given years prior. Is this proof that there aren't long-term effects? I think that we really have to look at the evidence, and the evidence is both biological and it's historical. So the biological evidence would be what kind of long-term effects could we expect. And of course, the historical is do we have evidence of actual vaccines having had long-term effects that were only detected a long time afterwards. The biological side actually says that you're basically injecting something that is very similar to the disease, to the virus in this case, but it's a, a killed form, or in this case, it's a form where we actually just generate the antigen, the part that will uh, stimulate antibodies. So in other words, there's nothing unusual about it. When a, people keep talking about the mRNA, but actually when you inject a virus or a dead virus or a live virus as part of the other vaccine, they also have mRNA in, in them. That's part of their makeup. So it's not an unusual kind of situation. But the, the question really now would be, do we have any vaccines that we know of uh, that have been used that have actually either continued to be used or been withdrawn because of long-term effects? And I, really, it's almost impossible to think of them. The only one I can say was suspected was measles, which is a live vaccine, where there was a possibility that because it caused some kind of modified illness, it could in the long term produce something that measles in the long term very rarely can do what called SSPE, but this is a very rare thing, and it was never shown that the vaccine does that. So, in fact, we don't have any historical evidence either. So, is it common, though, going back to, to what I think the heart of the first question is, is it common for drugs' long-term effects to present relatively immediately after being administered, or, or do drugs really do need years of study to, to find out what the long-term effects may be? Okay, I'm pleased to use the term drugs because we really have to distinguish between drugs and vaccines. Yeah. They're completely different. So if you ask me about drugs, they can have long-term effects, and we both of us know of them, and we can describe many, uh, some that were unexpected in the long term. But th yeah. these are not drugs. These are vaccines, and that's quite different. You're not actually injecting chemicals or any kind of uh, substances that are going to have long-term effects. These are very much simulated viruses or bacteria that will produce antibodies in your body. So it's, it's very close to what we get exposed to naturally. All right, so why do you think, and this may be a more political question than you're used to, but why do you think vaccines are such a target for public scrutiny uh, in, and, and rejection as opposed to modern medications and treatments? Why do people insist that vaccines be tested for years and years and years as opposed to, say, aspirin or, for that matter, OxyContin? Uh, and other such medications? I think the answer really lies in the fact that we give vaccines to healthy people, and we give drugs and medications to people who already have an illness, or we're trying to prevent an illness because we suspect that it might occur. So we're really saying here we're taking healthy people, and we actually 
injecting something into them. By the way, I use the term injecting deliberately. I, I wonder if people would feel the same way about an oral vaccine because there is something mystical about injecting. But basically, it makes no difference to the body for producing antibodies if you inject it or you swallow it. Just depends where it gets comes into contact with your immune system. So I think that's one of the main reasons why people. And in fact, again, we don't really test vaccines for dozens of years before we use them. There is a long process of development, but at some stage we give it to the public, and we still really don't know what will happen in the large population until we give it in the large population. And we really look for short-term side effects. When I say short-term, because that's really where we'll see them. When I say short-term, a month even. And the other is obviously the efficacy. But, uh, and of course, we have vaccines in use now for I don't know, 60, 70, or maybe hundreds of years. And we haven't uh, really detected anything dramatic. The only one I can think of, and again, it didn't have long-term effects, was the smallpox vaccine. Mm. And that's an interesting example because it was routinely given to the population until the 70s because it's a very severe disease. But the vaccine had some very severe side effects. Uh, but we tolerated them because we knew it was preventing a very severe disease. All right, Professor Manfred Green, thank you for joining us and for your insights again. Moving on, it's time to head back to Tokyo for our latest Paralympics update. Israeli athletes still kicking butt and taking names in some events as we enter day seven of the 2020 Summer Games. Connor Rifkin with the details. It's now been a week since the start of the 2020-2021 Paralympic Games in Tokyo, Japan. And the Israeli team, just 33 members strong, setting three world records and earning an impressive seven medals, four golds, two silvers, and a bronze. As for the winners in question, the latest medals again coming from swimming. Ami Dada On for one, taking gold in the men's 200 meter freestyle on Monday and setting a new world record in the process. Dada On competes in the S4 disability category and completed the race in 2 minutes and 44.84 seconds, 6 seconds faster than the previous record. And this is Dada On's second medal from this year's games, having also won silver in the 150 meter medley. Meanwhile, Israeli swimmer Mark Maliar similarly winning his third medal at this year's Paralympics, a bronze for finishing the 100-meter backstroke final in 1 minute and 10.08 seconds. Though the first two medals were gold, after Maliar finished first and broke world records in both the 200-meter medley and the 400-meter freestyle, and this in the SM7 disability category. Then finally, with the gold earned by Israeli Arab swimmer Iyad Shalabi and the silver medal earned by Moran Samuel for rowing, Israel's tally sits at a strong seven. Of course, again, the games are not over yet. Now by now, you're familiar with our friends at Ulpan Or, and today they're returning as a newly reorganized institute to talk about their new Hebrew mastery courses, courses which are specifically geared towards building a strong foundation and giving you an in-depth Hebrew language learning experience. To hear with all the details, Ulpan O co-founders and CEOs, Yoel and Orly Gano. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you again. for, for having us. Yoel, I'm gonna start with you. Tell us a little bit about these new Hebrew mastery courses. Uh, they seem fairly well-rounded, but, but what do they tackle and, you know, or emphasize? Okay, as a good Jew, I'll uh, reply with a question. Iran, do you know what PPT is? I don't. Okay. PowerPoint is my guess. Ah, that's uh, a good guess, but in our case, it's a different thing. At Ulpanor, PPT means pedagogy, psychology, and technology. Mm. And this is what our teachers are trained to do. They know how to be a good pedagogue. They know about psychology of their students, and they use extensively the technology which our products are based on. So. Having said that, what we wanted to achieve with our new courses is to streamline those and allow our students to meet in very small groups with their teachers and master the Hebrew in a new way, meaning that they start at a certain point, end at a certain point, they know what the achievement is expected from them, and they know how to get there. Clear, clear levels of, of, yes, uh, of advancement. Yes. Instead of just speaking to the teachers and loving that, that's what they're doing now. They clearly know what their goals are, and they actually point it towards those. Which it's, it's nice to know where you're headed. Exactly. Especially right. to know when you get there. Uh, Orly, you know, so explain a little bit more about the benefits of these new mastery courses and, and how they are unique 
to the previous courses that you were offering? Okay, the main thing in all our courses, the previous ones and these are materials. We have very, very unique, unique materials. We have about 100 books that we designed and are all on the cloud and people are getting them at the palm of their hand on their smartphone, iPad and computer. The thing is that our coaches that are so well trained so far were unable to, to, do it, to do the best they can. How? Because our courses were all along, along the year. Now our courses, are, our courses are semesters. So we start right after the holidays and we end before Christmas. You start after all the holidays, the, the Jewish holidays. The rest of the school year, making it exactly. easy Exactly. That's the institute about it. We are a regular institute. So, and I heard earlier you mentioned class sizes, uh, or at least maybe shrinking the class sizes. How big are we talking? Okay, what we used to have is a one-on-one -on -one course, meaning wow. about 400 people had one-on-one -on -one courses. Which All through the day. for your staff, I'm sure. Exactly. Well, yeah. And now we are going to have between two people to four people. Okay. Really, really small groups. And we have many methods of combining people so they will really, really feel the essence of studying together as a huge benefit. And you're meeting, even within these small groups, you're meeting each student within their like zone of proximal development? Yes, you're, you're you know, hitting? with the Zoom and being able to actually put people in different rooms, okay? Mm. Our teachers are trained to do that. So sometimes they combine different pairs. And what's interesting about it is also that our students, a student, let's say from Hawaii, can meet a student from Japan. And they meet outside of the, the course as well. They become buddies, friends, and they speak Hebrew. The common language with that Japanese and the American from Hawaii becomes Hebrew. <laughs> All right, so, okay. When are the courses taking place? I know you talked about semesters. Do you have a, a, the first semester maybe starting tomorrow? On the 3rd of October. 3rd of October. OK, we have right some time. Right after Sukkot. Yes, what we wanted to do is to avoid having the holidays, either Jewish sure. or international, during the semester. So the semester is solid block, solid block of studies. The study, study and things. Exactly. So and we have a fall semester, a winter semester, sure. And a spring semester. All right, and how do we sign up? Because I'm sold. So for the fall semester, which starts on October, October 3rd, 3rd. Exactly, yes. you already signed on on that. And uh, just uh, click on the link, and you'll see all the details that you need to start your course with and us. And you will also get a present, of a course. A present. A present, a special discount, many, many different presents and stuff for you. All right, so if you're looking to learn Hebrew, I can't say it any clearer than this. Look no for further than Ulpan Or. Yoel Orli, thank you so much again for coming in. Thank, thank you. you Iran. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast with Hannah Rifkin. Skies clearing up for the better part of this week, and now tonight's low is expected to be between 19 to 28 degrees Celsius. And tomorrow's highs may range between 28 to 41 degrees Celsius, depending on the area. And now back to the studio with Aaron. And now before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. Boy. Now, I don't know if he was actually sleeping during this meeting, but wow. When a man has to sleep, he's got to sleep. All right, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.21 shekels to the American dollar and 2.55 shekels to the Canadian dollar. And finally, for the latest updates and news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as to our newsletter at ILTV.tv. I'm Aaron Forrest. Be well. Thank you so much for watching.